All right, um, good evening, everyone. I am so thrilled to welcome all of you here to this event today. And it's so wonderful to see so many faces here tonight, from newcomers who joined us last year and our seasoned veterans who braved last year's snowstorm. Together, we're bound by our collective enthusiasm for innovation within the health science sector. First and foremost, I want to express our heartfelt gratitude to our sponsors, without whom this evening would not have been possible. A special thank you goes to the Mars Discovery District, an esteemed Canadian charity that played a pivotal role in the success of Canadian startups. Located in the iconic Mars building at university and college, they are instrumental in launching ventures through their comprehensive networks, accelerator programs, and commercialization strategies. Tonight, we are fortunate enough to have Luis, a senior, a senior venture manager from Mars. If um, Luis wouldn't mind raising her hand, <laughs> please feel free to reach out to Luis. Um, she's here to share her expertise and insights into the health science industry. Mars is dedicated to building a pipeline for young entrepreneurs like many of you here today. They are eager to guide and support you in bringing your innovative health tech ideas to life. Additionally, I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to, one, uh, to another one of our esteemed sponsors, Memotext. Memotext is, a for, is at the forefront of digital patient engagement and therapeutics offering an innovative platform that fosters the co-creation of tailored patient support applications. By leveraging health data to identify risks, Memotex drives the personalization of treatment adherence, care coordination, and patient support through secure omni-channel solutions. Their commitment to improving patient outcomes through technology aligns perfectly with the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish here today. And finally, I would like to expand a huge thank you to Fantuan they have generously provided each of us with a complimentary three-month membership, um, complete with a $0 delivery fee. This is a fantastic opportunity, as if you love food as much as I do, <laughs> I would encourage you to take full advantage of it. Now, as we move on into the evening, I encourage you to mingle and network. This is a prime opportunity to connect with industry leaders, practitioners, and scientists. Exchange ideas, share your experiences, and perhaps lay the foundation for future collaborations. Remember, the connections you make tonight could be the start of something groundbreaking, so don't be shy. Reach out, introduce yourself, and engage in meaningful conversations. Once again, thank you to our sponsors, Mars, Memotext, and Fantuan, for supporting this event. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Let's make this evening a memorable one filled with fruitful discussions and new connections. And with that, let's get on with our panel. Yours. Let me start with Ben. All right. Okay. Does this work? Awesome. Okay. So good evening, everyone. We're so excited for this panel. This is my favorite session of the entire Datathon. Um, our topic today is all about data. So the role of data in driving innovation and products in the field of AI. Um, we do intend for this to be super interactive. So today you've dealt with a lot of data sets played around with it, probably have questions, run into issues, and these are the experts to ask the questions to. So they've gone through it, they know how to fix things to an extent, right? Um, and so yeah, feel free to ask a lot of questions. Um, so I'm gonna jump straight into it. I do want each panelist to just give a brief explanation of your projects, past projects, future projects, goals, um, and just a, yeah, just an overall bio. Sure, uh, I'll start. So um, I'm up there listed as a PhD candidate, which was a while ago. Um, I would love to say I didn't have gray hair when I was doing my PhD, but I think I did have gray hair when I was doing my PhD. Um, so my background, I, I finished my PhD uh, quite a while ago in machine learning in healthcare, which, you know, back in 2010, whatever it was, um, felt like a new thing, a cool thing. Um, and I was first super attracted to it because I remember the module where, the, you know, we were having patients, we had their data, they had acute kidney injury, and we were predicting whether they would die in the hospital. And I thought, wow, you can predict the future with data. That seems powerful and cool. Um, obviously, dying is not cool. But the ability to predict that and then maybe do something about it was super exciting. So I did my PhD in that. Um, at Oxford, and then I moved over to MIT uh, because while I was doing my PhD, I became uh, super impressed by this data set, which I, was publicly available called Mimic 2 at the time, where I evaluated my methods and it was easy. So I went to MIT and I 
helped build the third version and the fourth version, um, and then built a chest X-ray data set, and then built an ECG data set, and then built another data set from Philips Healthcare, uh, and then helped some people in China build their data set. And then I kept building these data sets, and that was a very fruitful <laughs> and fun activity, and I got exposed to a whole bunch of different health systems and, and a whole bunch of different uh, data sets, mostly clinical data. Um, and then I moved to Toronto. Uh, I was and still am. A, I was a scientist at SickKids for a few years, but I left. I left there last year, um, and I still am a, a professor, a status-only professor at University of Toronto. Uh, and basically, um, my whole ethos is we should be sharing data. Basically, um, we should be getting the the health data out out of the locker and into into the air. Everybody should be able to be building models with this data. Uh, it's extremely powerful to unlock this health data and, and give it to people and let them use it. Um, it's right now, there's so much that's just sitting in a locker somewhere nobody is using. And we're always, always, always talking about, oh, the risk of, of sharing data, but we are not thinking about all the benefits we could have by actually analyzing this data, understanding health better, being able to predict the health of people, it, how they'll respond to certain treatments. We're never really kind of getting to there. So that's what I push. That's why I help publish so many data sets. That's what I still try to do now is, is, is kind of unlock, unlock it as much as possible. So that's me. I'll go next. Um, first, thank you, Eptahal and the gang, for organizing this event and inviting me to be here. Uh, it is, I guess I forget, but it's nice to see a room full of people at, what is it, 7.40 at night who are interested in talking about this topic. I'm usually mostly getting ready for bed. But um, so my, I guess my, my background or story, I'm probably something like an engineer stuck in a radiologist's body is how I would describe myself. So I did my back, my training in chemical engineering, my master's at MIT before I did whatever it is, 800 years of medical school and radiology residency and fellowship, et cetera. I now practice as a radiologist at Trillium Health Partners, which is, uh, for folks who don't know it, is the largest health system in the country by beds. And it serves the west half of the city. Really, Mississauga um, uh, would be its home. And uh, I'm a clinician scientist there with a part of my time where I helped build and run a uh, the AI deployment and evaluation lab. And, and the story there, the quick story there is that, you know, it became clear and it's still clear, but, you know, maybe five years ago that basically everybody and their grandmother was building an AI model for something in healthcare. But the real question was, you know, why is nobody using these things? Um, and, and the sub questions to that are, well, because nobody knows if they work. Do they work on real data? Do they work on real populations? Do they work on the diversity of populations that we actually see? Do they work with real users? There's humans on the other side that we sometimes forget about. Um, and um, uh, and with real like systems that are sometimes closed and annoying to work with um, that store the data. Uh, and then they need to, and then somebody needs to be able to pay for these things. And it needs to make somebody money. And it needs to do something good clinically for somebody else. So there's all these really annoying problems to most scientists um, that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and so it's kind of an engineering approach to how do we figure out how these models work in, in real life. And so I guess our work is largely around uh, the activity of uh, life cycle management of uh, machine learning models, but mainly focus on the kind of pre-deployment evaluation part, at least thus far in life plus deploying some real tools with a little bit of monitoring um, on the technical side, and then on the human side, figuring out how do you help health systems govern deploying models? Because it's not like you can just, you know, press a button on the app store and deploy a, you know, a mortality prediction tool for uh, renal inpatients with kidney failure. I mean, you can, in some some senses, but you probably shouldn't. Um, so uh, so we've done we've done this activity for 
uh, both open source and commercial models. We've done it kind of entirely academically. Um, we've done it for entirely for industry. We've done it retrospectively. We're doing it prospectively. And um, the, you know, the, the general pattern of figuring out how a model performs on real world data, how do you do it? Uh, how does it perform on important subgroups, ages, ethnicities, uh, sexes, um, the uh, different patient populations, so admitted patients versus outpatients versus ICU patients. Um, when you when you look at when you double click on a lot of these models, they basically perform differently in all these different populations. And so what you learn from them and figuring out where the human errors and where the model errors, they err in different ways. Um, when you look at all that, you can then figure out, hey, here's like a reasonable way of deploying this model. Maybe we'll only turn on emergency department and it'll only work in patients over 40. Um, and we'll put this big warning label, this fact card to remind everyone when not to use it. So all these really as I was explaining to Mika, really boring things for computer science PhDs um, are very interesting to me. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the type of work that I do and have to chat about it. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Mika and I actually am still a PhD candidate. I wish I was looking back on it, but I'm not. Um, and I am currently doing my PhD in computer science. So I'm more on the end of generating the models that may happen to be useless later in the clinical setting, but hopefully not. Um, and uh, the research I'm currently working on is developing interpretability methods for these models. So I guess the end goal for that would be being able to better understand kind of the features that these models use in order to make predictions so that you can have a better idea of like, for example, if a model does actually perform worse on minority groups or like certain subgroups of, of patients, what are those features that are separating um, those two groups and whether they can be mitigated in some kind of fairness algorithm. So um, I guess the research that I do is an effort to try and make these machine learning models more applicable downstream in clinical settings, but uh, the work that I'm currently doing is more specifically with machine learning models for genomics which is a bit more separate from uh, a clinical endpoint for now. And therefore, I feel more comfortable working in that area because it has less of a chance of downstream negative consequences for patients. But it's good to know that there's people out there that double check that work. Awesome. All right. So I have individual questions for each of you. Uh, we'll start first with Ben. I have your, yeah. Um, so with your experience, in building products, teams, and companies um, around healthcare data, how or what do you see is the biggest challenge in utilizing data for healthcare improvement? And then how do you approach these challenges? Uh, great question. I, I mean, there's the, I guess there's the technical data side, and then there's the, we'll call it the business side. And I think the largest problem, if I can be candid in, healthcare AI is that nobody's really figured out the business model for a lot of these AI applications. I'm not sure we want to go into it here necessarily, but a lot of the first generation of like hype driven AI companies out there, you can, you know, I'm a radiologist, so I can say this, you know, Jeff Hinton stood up, I don't know, five years ago or something and says, you know, in five years, radiologists are going to be, you know, they're not going to need to train anymore, yada, yada, yada. And so what did the venture capitalists do once they figured out deep learning was a thing? They're like, oh, it can read pictures. Well, what's an expensive thing uh, that reads pictures that we could, you know, replace? Oh, or automate. Oh, a radiologist. So they spent a whole bunch of money building all these models, but nobody asked a lot of the questions of, like, who's going to pay for it and why? And what does it actually need to do? And how are people going to use it? So you have a lot of these companies out there that are... Um, you know, uh, solving problems, but not as big a problem as uh, as it appears. Um, and so it should be like a cool free thing that comes on your iPhone and not like the iPhone itself, if that makes sense. Um, and so a lot of these 
um, a lot of the challenges around adoption are like figuring out how do you get, how do you actually create value both clinically, so it has to be useful for the patient and a clinical user, um, and then for whoever's paying for it, they need to justify paying for it. And that's why you see AI being deployed for things like revenue cycle management, which is super boring, but makes people money. Um, and, and operational things like flowing patients through the hospital or, um, you know, et cetera. Um, you can see it for risk of reduction as well. So some people will deploy models to avoid lawsuits. That's, that's, a, that's a pattern out there as well. Um, um, or if there's a real efficiency gain, we were just talking about MRI acceleration. That's now pretty common for deep learning models to be uh, deployed, often just integrated into the machines to decrease the acquisition time for an MRI from 15 minutes to 10 minutes or whatever. And you can obviously, you know, do the math there. So that's like the business model side. Then there's the technical side, which is, um, and the data side, is all of this data is locked in for the most part, although it is changing a little bit, proprietary systems, especially in with clinical data. Um, it is changing, but, you know, companies like Epic, which dominate the uh, at least hospital healthcare um, uh, market. It's not, it has not historically been the easiest to get data out, and they're trying to build their own kind of closed machine learning for health uh, ecosystem. So if you're somebody else, uh, it can be a bit of a problem. Again, it is, it is changing. Uh, imaging is a little bit easier, which is nice. It's kind of an open architecture. If you can read and exchange DICOM, you can probably do machine learning stuff with it, but the whole workflow hasn't been has not been figured out, especially about how you um, would accept or reject different suggestions from AI and then how you would like close the loop and, and, uh, and document it and yada, yada, yada. So, you know, there are, um, I could probably go on, but there's like business model challenges and there's technical slash data challenges that um, help prevent uh, um, uh, more machine learning healthcare model deployment. Wow, very nice. Um, okay, question to Mika. Um, so your research on enhancing the interpretability of genomic data uh, through machine learning as seen in your work, DNA BERT, which is awesome job. Um, so it stands out for its potential to transform healthcare. Um, and so how do you envision your work, um, particularly in genomic interpretability, intersecting with real world healthcare? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so right now, uh, kind of obviously with like the success of GPT-4 and stuff, people just want to make a large language model for the genome. And there are really good um, language models for protein sequences. And protein sequence kind of makes more sense as a language. It has a, a physical aspect to it that's not captured by the sequence. But these models generally tend to perform pretty well um, for DNA. Um, that's a bit trickier because a lot of the time these models are trained in exactly the same way as you would train like a GPT-4 model or like a BERT model that's on text. So you would just like hide a piece of text and then have the model learn how to predict like the missing part of a sentence. And, um, you know, human language is very structured. Um, not saying that the genome isn't structured, but a large part of the genome is just repeats. Um, and a lot of these models are just being pre-trained in very similar ways um, to uh, natural language processing uh, techniques. So they're just learning to predict missing elements of the genome. And a lot of the time we treat these regions all as equal. Um, and this has led to kind of this idea that like these large language models perform very well because of this fine tuning where they're just learning all of the language of the genome. Uh, sorry, the pre-training, and then later they're when they're like fine-tuned on a downstream task, they perform very well on these benchmarks that we've set out. So the, the problem is, is that we're not really evaluating well these pre-training methods. Um, it turns out that a lot of the time these models don't um, learn a lot of u biologically relevant data in, in pre-training, and the majority of the learning that occurs that's relevant is in the fine-tuning. And that means that like we're basically using a lot of compute and a lot of resources on a training regime that doesn't always make a lot of sense. And then kind of this like fine tuning is doing all the work. Um, 
And obviously, um, the issue with that is that beyond it being a waste of resources, is that we're not actually capturing meaningful, biologically relevant features um, in the genome. And if we want to be able to, for example, like have people send in their pers their like whole genome sequences and have it like read and understood and segmented and like for that to be able to tell us like, oh, like you have like a combination of these different regions that contributes to disease, we need to first be able to capture meaningful information in the genome. And second, be able, we need to know what regions the model is using to make predictions in order to say like we can actually determine and find targets for like drugs or treatments um, that will actually help these people. So um, downstream, I guess, yeah, the goal would be to have people be able to take their genomes and understand what are the regions that contribute to risk for disease or regions that are like able to be targeted by CRISPR or other technologies that can easily be, can easily be addressed. Um, but if we don't have models that we can understand what regions they're looking at that are features of interest, and if we don't have models that we know are um, verifiably using uh, regions of the genome that make sense in order to make predictions, then we're not going to ever be able to like get to the point where we can make a statement about a person's genome and what their risks and what the next steps could be for them. Wow, lots of room for innovation. Yeah. Cool. All right. My last question for Alistair, so prepare your questions, guys. Um, so considering your significant contributions uh, to creating and sharing large de-identified electronic health record databases, um, like Mimic, EICU, um, CRD, what are the key considerations in maintaining privacy while ensuring the data's utility for research and innovation? Oh, I got an easy question. That is very easy. Um, you remove their name and, and, and you're done. All right, that's good. You're good. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting. So for, for context. I do want to add, can you also compare Canada and U.S. data? Oh, U.S. is so much okay. easier. U.S. is the Wild West. It's lovely. Um, you just de-identify it. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can sell it. You can give it away. You can do whatever you want. It's, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we don't go that far. Um, but uh, it's interesting. So, so for those of you not familiar with uh, de-identification, ah, it's a great story. Basically, you could do whatever you want, and then... Um, the governor of Massachusetts collapsed while giving a uh, commencement speech one day. Um, he's fine. He, it was just a hot day. So he collapsed. And, uh, and at the same time, there was a Massachusetts insurance group who were uh, doing this sharing data thing so researchers could do things. And a PhD student at MIT uh, linked uh, the Massachusetts governor, uh, found the Massachusetts governor's data in in that insurance database and so the story goes like walked into his office and threw his medical record on the table and it was like oh you identified me and and there's a whole story of like you know she did it by linking to voter records and you know it's like also he was in the newspaper and exactly his medical procedures were in the newspaper so you you didn't really need the whole voter linkage thing and i think it's kind of a side but basically it freaked everyone out because they're like oh wow we can't just release data uh, broadly because it turns out that a lot of things make you unique, you know? Maybe your name makes you unique, but maybe your age and zip code and your gender makes you unique, right? And so uh, we, have to, we have to think about that. So, you know, uh, everyone panicked uh, and they passed a law in the US called HIPAA, which was basically, okay, here's what you gotta do with your health data. And H HIPAA had a provision called Safe Harbor where they said, okay, if you wanna de-identify a data set, you remove the name, you remove the medical record number, you remove the dates, but you could keep year. I think year is fine. Oh, but for age, if they're older than 89, you got to remove that. But if they're younger than 89, you can keep it in. Uh, motor vehicle numbers, uh, pictures of the face, uh, voice prints. Voice is fine, but voice prints are, are not allowed. Uh, so you can see it's, you know, this was like the 80s. So they were kind of like, I mean, they were doing their best. And then there's like an 18th one, which is also everything else you think might identify them. By the way, just covering, just covering myself, this is, this is the law for you. Um, but HIPAA was extremely useful to everyone in the U.S. because now they can say, 
oh, I need to share data with you. Okay, I need to de-identify it. How do I do that? Oh, there's this list of 18 things. Okay, I removed the 18 things. Here you go. And done. Like, didn't need to, didn't need to call up a, a lawyer and say, hey, do you think this is okay? Like, they just needed to do that and go. Um, and so that's what we did. And that's actually a really easy thing to do if you have a database. If you have a database of people, uh, you know, it's like delete column name from table person. Oh, great, I de-identified it. You know, it's really, it's really that, it's really that easy. Um, uh, and so, you know, that part, it gets a little bit more complicated, but at the very least, it only gets more complicated as you add more complicated data. Um, so the U.S. is great. In Canada, they never gave that kind of prescriptive, this is what health information is. They, they basically said remove, they said personal health information is, or personally identifiable information is, you know, information that can identify a person. So make sure there's none of that. If there's none of that, it's de-identified. And you know, okay, well, what is it? Can you define it? Nope, just do your best and remove it and then it's de-identified. And there's no like, there's no line that they draw to get from A to B. And so the consequences of this is all our wonderfully conservative and risk averse institutions don't share any data at all because they're like, you didn't make it really easy uh, you know, it looks like there's like this tiny little gap I have to jump over. I'm not jumping it. I could like trip or fall or something. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. So we actually have very little data sharing in Canada to our detriment because we're so worried about that risk of, of patient, patient privacy leaking. Um, and in fact, it's all what all the conversations revolve around. And uh, if I go into my really, really acerbic opinion, I think a lot of the time people use patient privacy as a shield to skip sharing data because you look like you're such a hero. No, I'm, I'm protecting patients' privacy by not sharing this data. You know, I've, I've seen people die because doctors don't know how to treat them and doctors don't know how to treat them because they never got access to the 30 million patient records that they could have poured over and analyzed to figure out, oh, in this case, this person with this disease, I shouldn't use this drug. Right. And the reason why they can't do that is because, again, the risk averse institutions don't want to share and and a whole bunch of other reasons. But at least this is a contributing factor. Um, so, you know, that makes it hard in Canada. But in the U.S., they said, you know what, we we worked with a hospital, a single hospital who were extremely forward thinking, super happy to share data, super happy with the initiative. Um, and they trusted us to do a good job, and, and we, we did a good job. And some of them were very technically difficult problems, like deleting name from a database is easy, but deleting name from free text clinical notes is a little bit harder. So we had to build some cool technology to do that, which was a lot of fun, which I enjoyed doing um, most of the time. 80% enjoyed, 20% banged my head against the table because I couldn't find the names because somebody named somebody decided flowers were a great name and it's hard to tell the difference between a flower and a name in a text and you know you get into all these like edge cases um but yeah so so that's kind of that's kind of what i think i think uh, we need to we need to stop sort of thinking about the risks to patient privacy we need to start thinking about the benefits to patients you know why uh, ask any doctor you know hey someone has sepsis what vasopressor should you use first every single one tell you the same thing no adrenaline right Ask them, okay, that didn't work. Which one do you use second? I, every do Dr. A says drug A. Dr. B says drug B. Dr. C says uh, drug C. And this is literally just like one step after standard practice. Like you go one step after standard practice and everybody's like, uh, the, the wind is blowing this way. I'm going to use this drug. It's crazy. And for some reason, we're okay with not using the data to make that better. Like, uh, I find it crazy, which is why I do what I do. Anyway, I could keep talking about this for a while, but I think you got it. <laughs> Amazing. So that concludes my questions. So we'll now open the audience. If you have questions, anything in mind, data sets you came across today, yeah. we'll go for you, and then we'll go for you.
Okay, so your question was how to balance between interpretability and evaluation of large models. Um, okay, from the interpretability standpoint, I would say these larger models and um, the, the more complex, the more black box they are, I think there's like two questions that need to be asked. One of them is, you know, like at some point it really is like, is it worth it to deploy a black box model that you don't understand in a clinical setting, even if it performs better? Like, if you don't know when it's gonna fail or if it's even gonna fail in a noticeable way, it's very difficult to justify using it. And I think there are certain situations in which these very complex high accuracy models just don't make sense to deploy um, because, you know, like you just can't validate what they're going to do. And while I do think that like the exploration of interpretability methods, and I think there's a lot of work that can be done for these more complex models, I think um, interpretability, interpretability methods are behind in terms of like there's way more um, complex models coming out than there are um, advanced interpretability methods that can handle the scalability issues of these models. Like a lot of our interpretability methods are feature attribution based or they require like a backward pass and looking at all of the gradients and like that just like doesn't work for a model like Informer which has like 200,000 base pairs that you could like go all the way back with like a sequence size that big. It just like doesn't work on a like a normal GPU. It's just not scalable. Um, and I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that can be done in order to improve interpretability methods and to make them better in order to understand these models better. And I still think there's a context where we have to decide, um, do these models actually make sense to deploy if we can't understand them? And maybe the better thing is like not to say if we can't understand them, but if we can't regulate them. Maybe I'll go from the uh, non-interpretability side, from the, I guess, clinical decision-making point of view. Um, I'm strongly in the camp of most decision makers in healthcare have very little idea of how things actually work, and all they care about is do they work. So, you know, pick a drug, maybe once in medical school, or at the first time they, you know, an oncologist read the journal article, they had some superficial understanding of the mechanism of action of, of a drug. But when they use it in real life, the only thing that matters is, does this drug work on this patient uh, or this type of patient from some randomized controlled trial or whatever? And what are the odds of it working? Because I need to communicate it to a patient. And what are the bad things that can happen if you do it? So I think that same mindset and, you know, some have said, you know, AI are the new drugs. AI is the new drugs. I don't know. I don't know how you conjugate that or whatever. Um, AI's is is the new drugs, I think is, if you want to quote me, um, is, is probably, I think the most relevant, um, mental model for approaching this because you can start to ask the same questions. So how well does this model perform in this population? Has it been studied before? Yes or no. How, how often does it error? What type of errors does it make? You know? And if I know that, then I might be comfortable using this and incorporating it into my decision making. It's not a perfect schema. One's like for, you know, treatment, and one's for decision making. But I think I think a lot of the hype around explainability is uh, a bit overhyped because even if you understand something and you know why it made a decision, if it still doesn't work half the time, you're not going to use it. You just you're just happy to know why it, you know what feature made it give the wrong answer. I don't really care. You got the wrong answer. Um, so it's a funny, you know, uh, quandary. But I'm, and I think especially with deep learning models or large learning models, who understands how those things work? They just spit out whatever, and you got to be able to evaluate whether that um, uh, reliably will give you the information that you need to make a decision. 
I think, no, no. I, it's kind of an agreement point. Uh, it's like, you know, like, um, uh, like there was a talk that uh, Marze Yusimi gave at ICML talking about how like you, when you get on an airplane, you don't, like most of us don't know how it works. We get on the airplane and we know that it's very unlikely that we're going to, you know, that the airplane's going to fall out of the sky and we're going to die before we arrive at our destination. And we feel confident that that airplane is going to take us somewhere because it's regulated by the government. There are people that check it and ensure that it meets certain standards. And, you know, like there has to be someone who knows how the plane works and someone who can understand it. And like, I think that interpretability methods are like for the people that are working on the models in order to make them better so that they can be regulated so that when they fail, they know how to adjust. But it's not like interpretability methods are not like everyone needs to know how a plane works to get on a plane. It's just so that you can have the regulation in place so that everyone can feel safe getting on the plane. 100%. All right. Uh, we'll go for your question next. Yep. My question is for Alistair. Um, <laughs> what are the specific policies or regulations uh, concerning data privacy in Canada that, in your opinion, should become more flexible to speed up research, uh, business, uh, and deployment? Great. Let's go to my uh, section A, B. You know, um, yeah. So, so healthcare is provincial in Canada, and and there is a uh, healthcare information privacy act that covers all of Canada, unless a province has one that's substantially equivalent, in which case the province is overrules it. And in Ontario, we have PHIPA, so that's the one that that is relevant. Um, and the part that needs to get, I don't know if it needs to get more flexible. I think what needs to happen is a carrot or a stick. Um, and basically, there needs to be either a very clear pathway that institutions can use, share slash use data for research, for improving patient care, which doesn't put them at risk. Where, um, where basically, I have been in conversations with with law firms which specialize in healthcare, specifically about the health data nexus, about how we need a training. What do you mean we need a training? We need a training. If the privacy commissioner sees that we don't have a training for cybersecurity, then we're in trouble. And there's no, there's no reason. It's just they feel like they need a training. And it's actually a lack of specificity in how you go from A to B that is causing all these people to make up all these difficult roadblocks and it varies by institute. You go to St. Mike's and you say, hey, would you like to share data? Oh yeah, totally. And it's up on the Health Data Nexus and, and some of you have used it today. You go to UHN or something and you say, hey, would you like to share data? They say, no, 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 PHIPAA doesn't allow that. And it's like, well, I mean, I literally have data from the hospital next door. So like, should I be calling the government or are you pulling my leg? Um, and so it really, what I think they need is a, a very prescriptive, uh, hey, this is what, this is what counts as de-identification or, or what have you. These are the rules under which you can share health data and no one will go after you if something goes wrong, if you followed all these steps. And if that happens, then that will, that will open the door to a lot more people comfortably sharing data. And once we start getting, uh, data to be shared, then, then, uh, then who knows what we could do. I mean, we're a single payer, right? So there is an institute which has all the outcomes. It's just we have all the actual concrete data scattered across 50 different hospitals, which makes it kind of difficult to do anything. Uh, you. <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, no. Um, you know, uh, it's a great, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of, excitement now, right? I, uh, especially after ChatGPT and all that stuff. One of the interesting things is ChatGPT changed a lot in healthcare, not because all these random residents were now uploading your medical records to OpenAI, which honestly, some of them probably did. And, and, and I can't wait for that to come out. Um, but it's because all of a sudden, all hospital leadership woke up and they're like, oh, wow, we can actually do something really cool with this. And everybody started to think, oh, wow, we actually do need to share all this data. And so now there's this momentum around 
API API-ifying the healthcare record or at least getting like getting the channels open. So I think with that, it's bubbled up to the ministry and and those kind of organizations that oh hey we need you know we need an AI strategy we need uh, we need uh, we need to be able to do these things. And I've seen reports that they've read from like four or five years ago, which list exactly what they need to do. So they know what they need to do. They just need to do it. And and I think sometimes you just need a kick. I, I honestly don't have the answer, but you know, if anybody is going to lead the charge, now's a good time because everybody's energized because everybody feels like we're on the we're on the new frontier, so to speak. Thank you so much for your talk. I learned a lot. Um, so this is a little bit of a loaded question, so I need to apologize in advance. So thank you so much for your talk. So one thing that I really appreciate is the pipeline, the application to deployment to innovation. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit um, on your collective wisdom in terms of some of the barriers that I have kind of seen um, as someone new to the industry. So from an innovation standpoint, you, Alistair, you did touch on this, um, about how risk averse people are. I, I feel like there's a need and a want for innovation and for change, but I'm noticing that a lot of people, um, no names mentioned, no organizations <laughs> mentioned are very risk adverse, but finding that balance between finding the real life insights that are really meaningful, profitability and de deployment and actually finding um, that really good balance of making sure there's a win-win-win situation seems to be something that's really, really difficult. And it seems like there's a lot of things that are misaligned. So I just wanted to ask from just like everyone's collective wisdom, just their insights and their experiences on, I guess, how to approach that or just like any any commentary. Uh, sorry for the loaded question. Thank you. You want commentary? I'll give you commentary. No, um, I think the optimist in me would say that there's a lot of the right pieces around the table in a place like Ontario, the data is in one place. We have some of the best universities. It's a robust economy. Um, so there's money to be invested and spent. Uh, we attract good talent. You know, all the pieces are there. You know, so why isn't it happening? Um, you know, I, I mean, like the simplest level, it's about leadership. It always is, it's always about people. Um, and somebody needs to be willing to stick their neck out for something like this because you're 100% right. Most people, and um, I credit Americans more than Canadians, um, there are very few people willing to kind of like stick their neck out and say, I'm kind of going to do this, and, and, and who cares what happens, right? Uh, it's a very Canadian thing and certainly healthcare thing to be like, what do I need to do today to make sure I don't end up on the front page of the Toronto Star, right? Because that's the real risk to people. Um, it's like, I really just don't want to get in trouble. So is that okay? I'm just going to keep kind of doing what I'm doing because it seems to be fine. It might not be working, but nobody's noticed that it's not working. So that means it's fine. Um, that's kind of the, the culture. Um, and... Uh, you know, you'll see it in hospitals, you'll see it in the ministry, you'll see it in these innovation centers. Um, it's like, there's these imaginary rules that, and, and constraints that don't actually exist that, I don't know, we believe, for some reason, we believe they exist. So, um, uh, just commentary. I, I, I think, I think there's, there's, you know, there's got to be some way to convince people to to do this. I think it has to do with like strong leadership and then it has to do with money. And if people can make money somehow doing this. And I think the, the real Canadian thing that is a real challenge is nobody likes talking about money in healthcare. Just like you're not allowed to, right? Even though we spend all of our money on healthcare. But you're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to talk about... If you say like private healthcare, people start like literally dying in the room or killing you. Like it's, there's, it's not a, and it, 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 which is very different than the US. I mean, they spend way too much money and it's completely a disaster for other reasons. 
but they're they're willing to spend money to get better. They have to compete with one another. Here, health systems do not compete with anyone except for trying to get more money from the government. So they they really only have one customer, right? And that is as the government, and the government's not incentivizing them to compete on quality or compete on this. It's basically like uh, this is being recorded, right? And we don't watch it. Whatever. It's kind of it's it's kind of like a. Uh, um, who's being harmed the most it's like it's like victimhood olympics kind of right it's like no i ha i have the worst budget and i need the most money no i need the most money and here's the bad things happening to me yada 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 so nobody's really competing on like we're the best service providers we've invested this ai we can we have a bit of money to invest in this ai thing it's going to give us 10x roi and here's why nobody ever cuts people in healthcare so like you can't actually like realize any savings so it's just very messy. Um, and, uh, and part of it's just like the Ontario culture that hopefully, you know, a new generation of folks can help kind of, you know, reform, um, go work in these, you know, it's like a long march through all these, all these organizations who to get data minded people in there who are willing to, I, I don't even, it's not even real risk as, as Alistair pointed out. It's like, can you step over this tiny little crack, right? Um, and, and you do need cover from somebody up top saying, listen, we made a decision as a government of, you know, over 15 million people, if we're talking about Ontario, that we are willing to, uh, we recognize there is a very small risk of re-identification of some data. Here's the worst things that could possibly happen. Here's how we're going to protect about it, pr protect against it, because certainly there are vulnerable people who would not want certain data elements known about themselves. But here's like the upside uh, if we do it right and, you know, economically and health outcome wise, somebody just has to make that case um, and make it normal. You're never going to please everybody. Uh, but right now we're in the, how do we, you know, basically minimize, it's, it's only a function of minimizing risk and the way to minimize risk is to do nothing basically. End commentary. Yeah, I mean, I can. Uh, uh, this is nice. This is going to be like a nice winch session where we just complain about all the all the problems. Um, I've I found innovation in in healthcare in Ontario surprisingly frustrating. Like, so I was at MIT for five years, right? And a na naive kid, right, worked with a single hospital. They shared data. We shared it with everyone in the world. You know, 40,000 researchers or whatever. 40,000 researchers accessing um, 60,000 patient records from this hospital. Have you ever heard of any issues? No. Like, and do the math on that and then calculate one over 40,000 times 60,000 times 10 years um, times however many data elements if you really want to. So, like, probability of risk is you know, very low. Risk is very low. Um, but coming here, the things that sort of surprised me were one, how fragmented a single payer system could really get. Um, and I think that makes it very difficult to do innovation in that, you know, you, you, this is a kind of a classic, uh, problem for someone who has a technology where, uh, in healthcare, where, um, you build your technology. Okay, great. I'm bringing it to hospital A six months to get it deployed in hospital A. Great. Now I'm going to go to hospital B another six months to deploy it in hospital B, great, hospital C. And this actually is, is a big challenge of healthcare in general, not just, not just in Canada. Um, so, so that's kind of issue number one. Um, but issue number two really is this like desire for inaction. And I too have heard the, I don't want to be on the front page of the Toronto Star or whatever. And, you know, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, Steve, you're not going to be on the front page of Toronto Star. I'm not going to. Nobody cares. Like, I, my mom won't even talk to me about what I do. Like, it's not going to be on the front page of Toronto Star. <laughs> yeah. Like, if uh, it happens even when people are doing everything right. So th there was this big scandal with Utopian as well, where a whistleblower, Utopian is a data set, a whistleblower said, Utopian is this data set of primary care records and they're selling it. They're selling these primary care records. That sounds awful, except they weren't. They had a fee to access the data set if you're a researcher, which is like super standard for academics because 
they have computers. You need to give them money so that they can buy new computers when their current computers break, because that's how computers work. And yet it became this huge thing, uh, which I'm sure none of you have even heard of, but it like killed all innovation around that data set, dead, gone, um, for, for, for nothing. So it's, it's, it's very uh, frustrating in that way uh, that you're sort of uh, not sure how to proceed because everybody is afraid of making a mistake. And then you're bringing in this new technology called AI. Um, and then you, you really have people who don't have a bias for action. Like they really don't want to rock the boat. And uh, it's interesting because I always thought company values in like a company were a little bit trite or silly where you say like, oh yeah, our company value is one of Amazon's famous, uh, they have like 12 or 14 different things that you need to, I think you actually need to memorize them when you're interviewing so that when an Amazon, when the interviewer asks you about them, you can respond and give an example of how you follow that. It's, it's very culty and, and weird, but one of them is bias for action. And like, that's a value that somehow we need to infuse into the Ontario health system because people are, are really happy to not change the status quo until things break. Um, and then, you know, do the, do the minimum. Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's kind of the number one thing I would want, I would want people to, to sort of get. I guess uh, the last thing that, that I'll say is um, if AI is like the new drugs, drugs take a really long time to get approved. I'm, I'm pretty sure clinical trials are long and everything. Um, and at the speed that machine learning is going at, it's not going to be relevant by the time it gets deployed right now. So there should be some kind of either different standard or different procedure. Free. Any hands up? Any more questions? Three minutes left. One last question. Yeah, yeah right. I'll throw the last one then. Very interesting discussion so far. Um, so we're all discussing the risk adverse problem, the bias for inaction. I think one of the problem too is that we're very good at quantifying risk that are negative, like information leakage and stuff like that. But we're very bad at quantifying risks that are more, let's say, midterm or long term. And and you you mentioned maybe that patient could be saved, right? So how do you get better at quantifying the risk of inaction, basically? Because I feel like you have to give them numbers, otherwise they won't move. Uh, I say you don't, because that's too hard. I honestly would take a completely different approach, which is find the people who are on your team to begin with. Um, I think, I think it's very hard to quantify risk and I think it's very hard to quantify future gain. If I was good at it, I would be playing the stock market, uh, but I'm not, so I won't. But I think the key is to find the people who are already on your team. Um, I guess one of the advantages of a fragmented health system is that there are institutes where that's true. For example, Mohammed, who I think was here earlier today, is great. Super keen, super forward, uh, uh, you know, breaks down barriers when, when, when they're there. Um, great person. Collaborate with him. Don't collaborate with the hospital who are telling you, no, it's, it's bad, it's, uh, and, and move forward that way. And I think there's enough, there's enough people like that in the Toronto ecosystem that you can start with them, and then eventually the momentum will be with you because you'll build a good technology, you'll build a good product and it will help people and it will, it will, um, or at least this is what you should be doing. And this is what we hope happens. Obviously, you know, sometimes it doesn't work and, and that's okay. And, and you know, you, you live with that, but that's the strategy that I would do because I remember times when they were sending us data and the people at the, even people within this forward thinking hospital were like, whoa, 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 why are we sending data? And the leadership team there was like, no, 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 we trust, we trust these people. They're great. They're amazing. You should, you should keep sending them the data. Um, they know what they're doing. We have a great partnership and we needed that leadership in the hospital to be on our side and pushing for us. So you, I think the mistake that 
I made was not always identifying those people in my collaborators, uh, not always identifying who those forward-thinking people were, who the people were who would push it forward. Um, and I maybe naively thought, you know, I could convince people that the technology was so great or I could, you know, pull them along with, you know, uh, appeals to, to the greater good. Um, and maybe I overestimated how convincing I was because that didn't work in a few instances. And I think uh, a lot better strategy that I would give you all is, is to try and identify those people early, maybe get good at identifying who those people are early, uh, your sort of allies in the, in the health system and, and work with them. And I think there's plenty of them in the, in the ecosystem that you can still push things for it, right? Like Ben is an interventional, radi are you interventional? No, Ben is a radiologist who doesn't intervene in people because he's not that, um, you know, and he's here, right? So these people exist uh, for sure. You just have to find them and then you have to hold on to them as tightly as possible. <laughs> so, and, and I, you know, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about it. You know, how do you quantify inaction? Um, but it's like a nice academic or economic way of thinking about it. And I think what I've learned most <laughs> in life is like people are people. People are very bad quantitative decision makers. People are much more risk averse than they are gain seeking. Like we we know all this stuff, um, and 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 but equally, the world can be shaped by very few people, right? Like, and my only word of wisdom to you is: if you guys picture the world differently than how you see it today, just you know, make it. And if you apply a force, you'll be amazed how much the world will bend in that direction. It's actually kind of crazy because most people just like sit around waiting it, for it to change. So I don't know the exact answer, but um, you know, you only need like one person in the right position to unlock a whole bunch of things for, for, for something like this. Um, and I don't know exactly how we'll get there, but if everyone in this room does something in that general direction, you know, it probably will be better than it is today uh, and hopefully not worse. Um, on a much less people-related subject, obviously, um, uh, it's hard to show an improvement over baseline if the baseline isn't measured. So, like, we don't evaluate doctors. It seems like we don't report statistics. We don't have gold standard data sets. It's really hard to show uh, a measurable improvement over a baseline that doesn't exist. So I'm not saying that Psycho like people's psychology would actually like bend to real quantitative numbers showing a valuable improvement over, but we can't even show that in a lot of cases. So I think that also might be a problem. Agreed. Wow. Lots of, lots of great tips from this panel. All right. This wraps up the panel session. No more questions? Okay. So you still have a chance to interact with our panelists through the networking, so feel free to mingle. Um, it's a, we're not a lot yeah. today, um, so this is your chance to milk this opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs>